get started, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone who showed up for the event last night to volunteer, hang out, eat pizza. I think it was a really great turnout. I had a lot of positive reviews from the public, and everyone said they had a ton of fun. So thank you. You guys made the event, and it really means a lot to me for your participation. Second, um, I know this has been talked about a lot already, but I've literally been tweeting my thumbs off for this, trying to capture a lot from the event going on. So if you guys follow the account or follow the Instagram account, I will tag you in anything that I know you're in. So please follow. Um, this is the hashtag, the AbGradCon, for just like anything related to the conference. And yesterday during our SciComm panel, I tagged everything with the AGC SciComm. So if you guys had any quotes or anything that you really loved or thought was cool that you want to share, I would appreciate it if you would use these hashtags. Okay, so um, as Julia already outlined, we will have the first half of our talks up until about 10.05, and then we'll take a quick break, and then we'll have the rest of our speakers. So I'm going to start off today with the three domains of life. So a very um, simple breakdown of the three domains, which are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, is that bacteria have no membrane-bound organelles. Archaea are typically known for being extremophiles, and eukaryota have membrane-bound organelles within their cells. And here is my favorite eukaryote, my cat. <laughs> so this is an example of the tree of life. This is a phylogenetic tree, which is based on the sequencing of the 16S rRNA gene. So again, we have the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And here's really quick the central dogma for those of you who might not be familiar with biology. We have DNA, which is the library. DNA holds all of the genetic information. Um, then DNA trans scribes into RNA, which kind of relays the message, and then RNA makes amino acids and proteins and everything, which does kind of a lot of the heavy lifting in our bodies. So as I said, the phylogenetic tree is based on the sequencing of the 16S rRNA gene. Um, it's rooted with LUCA, which stands for the last universal common ancestor. Something important to keep in mind about LUCA is that it is not necessarily the first organism on Earth, but the organism that persisted and didn't become extinct. So it's the idea that every living organism can tie back to a single living thing. So 16S rRNA sequencing is this um, sequencing of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And this is also known as deep sequencing. So it kind of gives us a very um, accurate profile. It's almost like the passport or the license of the microbes living there. It tells us, okay, this guy's here, this is here, this is here, and it can tell us who is in an environment. So this is the same tree that was shown earlier, but as you can see with the colors, th this might not be clear, but this shows the maximum growth temperature. So green is um, up to 60 degrees Celsius, yellow is up to 75, orange is up to 90, and anything that's red is 90 degrees Celsius and above. So as you can see within the eukarya domain, it's mostly green. There's a little bit of color, but for the most part, eukarya are mesophiles, which means that they prefer more mild growing temperatures. Um, over here in bacteria, we have a little bit more color diversity, so they're a little more thermotolerant. And over here, as I mentioned, archaea are typically extremophiles. And as you can see, there are a lot of bugs in here that like hot temperatures. So as I was saying, thermophiles have, are organisms with a preference of high temperatures ranging from 41 degrees to 122 degrees Celsius. And acidophiles are organisms that prefer highly acidic environments. So this is an example of the Yellowstone National um, Park hot spring, which is both very hot and very acidic. And really quick, this is the pH scale, which ranges from 0 to 6 for acidic, 7 is neutral, and then 8 to 14 is alkaline. And acidophiles are over in this region preferring high acidity. Psychrophiles are organisms with a preference of very low temperatures, ranging from negative 20 to positive 10 degrees Celsius. This can be found in like polar ice caps, the frozen tundra, the bottom of the ocean where there are cold seeps, anywhere that's just really cold. Halophiles are organisms with a preference of high salinity conditions. And within the halophile designation, there are slight, moderate, and extreme preferences. And this just depends on the salt concentration. A local example is the Great Salt Lake, which is five times saltier than the ocean. And this pink color is actually a bunch of halophiles in um, the Archean domain. Um, 
Another example of an extremophile are alkylophiles, which are organisms that prefer alkaline environments. This is an image from the Lost City cruise that the Brazelton Lab and a few others went on last fall. Um, if you were here for the opening ceremonies, Dr. Brazelton showed some videos and pictures of this place. So they're on the opposite end of the pH scale from the acidophiles, and they're over here in an environment from 9 to 11. So there are different kinds of extremophiles. There are organisms that um, don't love oxygen, so they're found in anoxic conditions. There are organisms that live in low nutrient environments. Um, and one thing that's important to remember is while these environments are extreme to us, these guys are completely happy here. Like this is their happy place, they're on vacation, this is what they were made for. So while these appear uninhabitable or uncomfortable to us, they are just having the time of their life wherever they are. <laughs> so there are some heavy words within the microbiology field when it comes to the organisms. Like this word, chemolithoheterotroph, sounds like a mouthful, but it can give you a lot of information about the organism, where it lives, and what it does. So a quick breakdown of some of the terms. Troph um, means nourish. Litho literally means eater of rock. Auto means self or self-producing, and in this context, it's an organism that can produce their own organic compounds. Hetero cannot produce its own food. Chemo is the oxidation of chemical, whether organic or inorganic compounds, and oligo means few. So earlier I mentioned that there are organisms that can live in low nutrient environments. They would be classified as oligotrophs. So back to that word chemolithoheterotroph. Chemo, oxidation of chemicals. Litho, eaters of rock. Hetero cannot make its own food. Troph, nourish. So chemolithotrophs are organisms that derive their energy from inorganic minerals or other geological processes. So here is kind of another little breakdown of that flow chart. So if you know the energy source and the carbon source, then you can almost designate where that organism would be and the kind of environment that it lives in. So autotrophs make food from carbon dioxide and heterotrophs cannot make their own food. So earlier I mentioned sequencing of the 16S rRNA gene. Another type of sequencing that's very common for environmental microbiologists is called metagenomics. It's the study of genetic material directly from environmental samples. So when it comes to metagenomics, you're taking an environmental sample and you extract the DNA and you're sequencing everything. Um, so this gives you kind of a big picture idea of everything that can possibly go on in this environment. It's um, an analogy that our lab uses commonly is that it's like taking a bunch of puzzle pieces together from different puzzles, throwing them in a pile, throwing the boxes away, so you don't know if the puzzle is complete, you don't know what it looks like, and you don't know how many puzzles or pieces there are, and then trying to piece everything together. So while 16S is deep, metagenomic sequencing is wide. And like I said, this gives you the metabolic potential of everything that could be going on in an environment. Metatranscriptomics, on the other hand, is a study of gene expression, which is RNA-based, and this can tell you exactly what's going on. So right now, we're all alive, we're all breathing, we could be skydiving, we could be reading a book, we could be taking a nap, you could be getting a root canal, or you could be listening to this talk, which I'm hoping is a little less painful than a root canal right now. So again, the overview is 16S tells us who is there, metagenomics tells us what they can do, and metatranscriptomics tells us what they are doing and how they are doing it right in the moment. So ORP, or oxidation reduction potential, is a measurement within an environment. So earlier I mentioned the pH scale, which is a measurement of the hydrogen ions present in the environment. ORP is kind of similar as it's a measurement of what's going on, but instead of what's going on in the environment, it's telling you how easily electrons are transferred from one species to another. So in case any of you guys remember oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. We have electron donors, which donate to the electron acceptor, and that means that they become oxidized. They're losing that electron. Um, on the other hand, electron acceptors who accept the electron become reduced when they gain that electron from the donor. Um, so this is really wordy, I realize that, but all I wanted to take away from this is that the more positive a value, the stronger oxidizing agent, and at the same time, the weaker reducing agent. And on the other end, where there's a higher negative value, it's a stronger reducing agent and a weaker oxidizing agent. 
So this is the electron tower, and this is kind of the same um, idea where the better reductants electron donors are up here, and the better oxidizers, um, better electron acceptors are down here. And all we really need to get from this is that the longer the arrow, the more energy is obtained. So glucose to oxygen, that's from the top to the bottom. So there's a ton of, of energy to be gained there. Whereas with hydrogen gas to carbon dioxide, there's not much going on. There is energy available and present, but it's not going to be a significant amount. Um, relating, also relating to ORP, our oxygen levels. So there are different ranges of oxygen concentration or dissolved oxygen within water. Um, so there's oxic, hypoxic, and anoxic. Oxic is classified as like a healthy dissolved oxygen content. That means macroorganisms can live there, like fish and other aquatic animals. Hypoxic is kind of on the range of like, well, something could be living here, but probably nothing big. It would be mostly bacteria or other organisms. And then anoxic is pretty much nothing going on. There's, if there's anything living there, it's definitely going to be microbial. Um, ORP has a positive correlation with oxygen levels. So the higher the oxygen levels, the more positive the ORP value. And then down here, it's the same. The lower the oxygen levels, the more negative ORP values. And down here are going to be like a lot of heavy metals and kind of the more extremophiles. Um, and with that, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. So our next speaker will be Nicole Wagner talking about metagenomic profiling of the methane-rich anoxic basin of Lake Untersea and of ocean worlds. Thank you so much.